This video is sponsored by Brilliant.org. Welcome to part two of this home automation series. In the first video, I went over the plan for the project. I'm building a home automation system that can control all of my smart devices and my non-smart things. It's gonna be a set of microservices that work together and initially a simple web interface on the front. The first microservice that I'm gonna build in this video is the device registry service. This service will store information about all of the devices on the system that can be controlled. So it just needs the basic ability to create, read, and delete resources. A resource is an object that the, the API stores, so it could be an employee, an article, or in this case, a device. Multiple resources of the same type is called a collection, and this ability to create, read, and delete resources will be exposed over a REST API. So an API is just an interface that you can make a request to and get a response from. If the API follows some particular guidelines and principles, it can be considered a REST or a RESTful API. REST stands for Representational State Transfer Somehow. One of the main features of a RESTful API is that it must be stateless, so it can't store context between requests. It can't remember who you are or what you've previously asked. Now that means every request that is received must contain all of the information necessary to process that request. Requests are made over HTTP or HTTPS, same as what browsers use to retrieve websites. And when making HTTP requests, there are various verbs or methods that you can use to make different types of requests. You've got get requests. These should be used for retrieving information. So a get request should never modify anything. There should be no side effects. Nothing in the database should be changed. If you make the same get request multiple times, then you should get the same response each time. This is known as an idempotent request. Next, you've got post requests, and these should be used for creating a new resource. So these are not item important because if you make the same post request five times, it's gonna create five resources. So it's not safe to do over and over again. The last method that we care about today is delete, and as you'd expect, this is used for deleting resources. This is also defined to be item important because if you make the same request multiple times, it has the same effect as just making it once, so it's safe to keep doing over and over again. And that's because if you ask to delete a specific resource, the first time you do it, it's gonna do that. Second time, it's not gonna find that resource anymore, so it's not gonna be able to further change the state of the system. There are other methods, but we don't need them yet. This will get us started. So let's think about the endpoints that we want for this API. First, let's have slash devices to represent the collection. So all of the resources, all of the devices. Then slash device slash and an ID to represent a specific resource, so this would show us a particular device. I'm gonna call it identifier instead of just ID because ID to me implies that it's gonna be a number, just an integer, but in this case, it could be a string, it could have words in it. So it'll just be a little reminder not to treat it as a number. So they'll be the two endpoints. Now let's think about which methods, which HTTP verbs that we accept. For the collection, we wanna be able to view the collection, so we'll accept get requests, and we wanna be able to add a new resource, a new device to the collection, so we'll accept a post request to do that. For the single resource endpoint, again, we wanna be able to view it, so we'll have a get here. And we wanna be able to delete a particular device. So you guessed it, we'll use the delete HTTP method for that one. Okay, I've made a new directory for the service, and I'm gonna start by writing a readme, and I'll use this as documentation for the API, and it'll be useful for somebody else if they wanna use it, or for me in two months when I've forgotten how it works. Create a markdown file. Let's think about the responses that the API will give. They're gonna be JSON, which is pretty standard, it's easy to read. And one technique is to use an envelope. So instead of returning a resource directly or the array of resources representing a collection directly, you wrap it in a property called data. And this lets you add extra metadata like a message describing what happened. Lots of people are against this and think that enveloping is redundant and that the HTTP header should contain all of the metadata. But I'd rather have a little bit of redundancy and then have the extra flexibility in case I do decide that I need it. We'll not bother writing out the full wrapped envelope response every time, we'll just describe what's gonna appear in the data field. The first feature will be to list all of the devices. To do this, we'll make a get request to the slash devices endpoint. 
This will return a 200 stasis code, which means OK. And in that data field, it's going to have an array of objects. This is the collection. It could be empty if there are no devices in the registry, but usually it's going to return multiple objects. Each object is going to represent one device. Uh, like we discussed, it needs an identifier. So this could be like floor lamp. Next, it'll have a friendly name which will show in interfaces. Then we'll store the type of device. And for now, this can just be an arbitrary string. We'll not impose any restrictions on it. And finally, the controller gateway. So this is the IP address to send requests to if you want to control this device. If you're just here to learn about Python and don't care about this home automation stuff, don't worry about what this means. We could just as easily be storing employees and have name, age and address in the object. So it could also return another one. Next is registering a new device. This will be a post request to slash devices. Post requests can have a body with extra information. So whenever you submit a form on a web page, that sends a post request and the contents of the form becomes the body of the request. So here we'll define what the request needs to contain. And it's just going to be the things that we're storing about a device. Got the identifier, then they've got the name. the device type, and finally, the controller gateway. It's good to think about the edge cases, uh, like if a device with the identifier already exists, what we're going to do, we'll make it simple and just overwrite it. This is going to return a 201 status code, which means created, and it'll return the object that it's just created. So it would just be like one of these things from the collection. Next, we want to look up device details. This will be a get request to slash device slash whatever the identifier of the device is. There'll be two potential responses from our API. We could get a 404 not found if the device does not exist, or a 200 OK otherwise. And again, we're just going to be returning a single object, so I'll copy and paste uh, the previous example. Finally, deleting a device. Delete request to slash devices slash the identifier, and either 404 not found, or just for fun, let's return a 204 status called on success, which means no content. So this means the action happened successfully, but there's no useful data that we can return. All right, this is really good. Uh, we've planned out perfectly what we need to build. And at the same time, we've written some nice documentation about how to use our API. Time to write some code. Let's start with a really simple run.py file and literally just make a hello world application and make sure that it works. I think it would be nice if we could run this inside of a Docker container. I'll make a Docker file. We'll base it on the official Python image. And we can just copy their Docker file example straight from there. Just changing the name of the script. If you want to know more about Docker and how this works, I've got some videos on that. You'll notice it automatically installs requirements from requirements.txt. So let's just create that file and leave it empty for now. Next, the Docker compose file. We'll have one service build the doc file in the current directory and mount a volume. So mount the, the current directory into user source app because that's what the docker file is doing anyway. And that's all we need to run the application. So if we do docker compose up, after it's built, it outputs hello world right there. I'm going to make another directory called device registry inside the one that we're already in. And this is going to be a package holding our Python code. We could just put all of the code in this run.py file, but I think it's nice to have a little bit of organization. To tell Python that this is a package and not just some random folder, we need to make a file called underscore underscore init underscore underscore dot py. OK, we can write our code in this file. We're going to use Flask, which is a micro framework to help you build web applications. It's really lightweight, really easy to use. So we'll import Flask. But where does Flask come from? Well, we need to install it using pip, but we don't have to do that manually. We just need to add it to our requirements.txt file, and it'll happen automatically when the Docker image is built. Following the example on the website, we'll do this to create app. You can read the documentation if you want to know more about how this works and what's happening here. 
We could copy this hello world root for the index, but let's do something a little bit more useful. Let's call it index, and instead of returning hello world, which would be output to the browser if you went to this root, let's output the documentation that we wrote. So we can use the with construct here uh, and open os.path.directory name of the app's root path. So this is going to open the readme file in the applications directory as a read-only file. We're going to read the contents of the file and then convert it to HTML by doing markdown.markdown. .markdown. We'll import markdown and add it to the requirements. We need to update run.py, import the application and then run it. Build it again to get the requirements. We need to expose a port if we want to access it. I'll expose this on port 5000. I have of course forgotten to import OS. But when I refresh, I get the documentation that we wrote and it's rendered as HTML, it looks really nice. Okay, let's do something a bit more useful. I'm going to use shelve for object persistence. I haven't used it before, but it looks really simple. Probably not ideal for a big production system, but this is a tiny project and it's just for me, so it's fine. Maybe. Let's try it. I'm going to steal this little pattern from the Flask documentation to handle a connection to a database. Of course it's not a normal database, it's shelved, but it's fine, it's a nice abstraction. So if I just replace this call to connect to database with shelve.open, and we'll just call it devices.db, the, the file that it uses to uh, put stuff into, and of course import shelve. I'm going to use Flask RESTful which is an extension for Flask that gives you some tools to create an API really quickly. So what you do is you create a class for each endpoint, and then you create a function for each method that you want to accept. So first we have the get method. We're going to loop over every key in this data store and put it all in an array and return the whole thing. We'll wrap it in the data field so then we can add a message. And that should give us the collection, all of the devices that the registry knows about. Postman is an app that you can use to make HTTP requests. I'd also look at Paw if you use a Mac because it's better. If we make a GET request to the device's endpoint, the correct status code is returned, we get 200, but the data field is empty because obviously there are no devices. Next is the, the POST function that will let us create devices. Here I'm going to be lazy and use the request parser that's built into Flask RESTful. It's lazy because they're planning to remove it in the future, so I should use a different library instead, but this is so easy to use. So shelf is a key value store and the keys are going to be the device identifiers because we expect those to be unique. And if it's not, it's going to overwrite whatever's there. And we'll just store the whole object that we receive. Now we just need to make one more class to represent the individual resource. This time we're going to receive the identifier as part of the URL and that will be passed to the get function as a parameter. And we'll do the same for delete, that also receives the identifier. Get the get access to the data store. We'll do exactly the same thing as the, the get request if the, the device identifier doesn't exist. Otherwise delete the, the device with that key. And we don't want to return anything this time because it is status code 204. So now we can create a POST request to the, the device's endpoint. 
and we can send it some data. And what we get back is a 201 saying it has been created. We could do it again to create a different device. Just notice there's a typo, um, this should say keys and this should say devices. But now if we make a get request to the devices endpoint, then we see the devices that we've just created. We can see a specific one by going to slash device slash flow lamp and we could delete it if we wanted to. So the first time we get 204 no content, which means it happened successfully and if we do it again, it doesn't exist anymore, so we get a 404 not found. And that is how you create a dockerized RESTful API in Python in under 100 lines of code. You can find the code exactly as I've written it in this video on GitHub in the tutorials repo. The link is in the description. You can also look up the home automation repository to see the up-to-date version, the code that I'm actually using, because obviously this is going to change over time. This project is largely just a big learning opportunity for me, and hopefully for you too if you follow along with the videos. I didn't really know Python before I wrote this service, and solving real problems, I think, is definitely the best way to learn something, as opposed to just reading, in this case, the Python docs. Programming is only one small part of computer science, and if you want to dive further into that, then I recommend Brilliant.org, a problem-solving website that teaches you to think like a computer scientist. Instead of just passively reading documentation, you get to build your understanding by walking through various problems. This kind of practice is a great way to build up your problem-solving skills so you can tackle new problems that you haven't seen before. They offer curated courses on computer science fundamentals, algorithms, machine learning, all super useful stuff, particularly in the context of building a home automation system. And everything is broken down into bite-sized chunks. Go to brilliant.org slash jakewright to find out more and sign up for free. The first 200 people who go to that link will also get 20% off the annual premium subscription. I hope this was interesting. Leave a comment if you've got any questions. Click like if you haven't already. And do subscribe because there are going to be more home automation based videos in the future. Thanks for watching.